Welcome everyone to our fourth episode in this series, Understanding People, brought to you by Get Abstract. I'm Kirsten Miller Doberman and I am your host. Throughout this series, we're looking at all different types of interpersonal communication, exploring why we misunderstand each other and bring in authors and experts to help us learn how to connect with each other better. In this episode, we will look at how to read and decode nonverbal communication and discuss how understanding body language can be a key to understanding our own quirks as well as those of others better. My guest today is Professor Adrian Furnham. He has doctorates from both Oxford and London University. He has moved from as professor of psychology at University College London after 37 years to the Norwegian Business School. He has written over 12 hundred scientific papers and over 80 books, several of which are in our Get Abstract libra library, including the one we are going to be basing our discussion on today, which is body language in business. Adrian is a fellow of the British Psychological Society and a past president of the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences. He has been a consultant to over 40 major international companies with particular interests in top team development management change, performance management systems, psychometric testing, and leadership development. So Professor, you're the body language expert. Welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. Thank you us. very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, so we'll just dive straight in. What is nonverbal communication and what are some myths about it? I think we receive information from other people from three sources. We talk about verbal, vocal, visual. Verbal are words. You can hear the words I say, you can read uh, your, your uh, emails and so forth. Those are the words. Vocal are the sounds with the words. So it's my accent, the speed in which I'm talking, maybe some slight indications of anxiety in my voice. And there's visual signals, what you see. So there's what you see, television, what you hear, radio, what you read in newsprint. And nonverbal communication usually is thought to be vocal and visual. Now, there's a lot of myths written about nonverbal communication. For instance, people say how amazingly powerful it is that, you know, the numbers you hear, 75% of the information is, 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 is um, uh, conveyed by nonverbal signals. Oh, oh, yes? If so, why learn to speak another language? Why learn French and why learn German if you can do yeah. it all nonverbally? Yeah. Yes, nonverbal communication can be powerful, particularly powerful when the words don't fit the actions. In other words, people are obviously anxious about something and claiming not to be anxious. So where there's disparity, it's interesting. The second myth, I think, is, is symbolism. The idea is that all sorts of behavior are deeply symbolic. If you watch Prince Charles, you'll see one of the things he often does, he fiddles with his wedding ring or he fiddles with his cufflinks. It's the cufflinks that are interesting. And people say he feels as if he's um, uh, hand, handcuffed to the monarchy. Nonsense. <laughs> it's simply a twitch. And people, you know, they say that these, that these, everything one does, the scratching of the ear or whatever is deeply symbolic. No, it's not. Sometimes it is, it's not always. And the third thing I think people say is that nonverbal communication is very controllable. We can always control out. Somehow, if you learn about it, you can control your behavior. I can learn not to sh show my anxiety. Well, it's partly true with some people, but I can't now control the dilation of my pupils. I can stop moving, but I can't do some of these things. I can't stop blushing if I start blushing. So myths of control, myths of symbolism, and myths of power perpetrate this area. Okay, and what are a few different types of nonverbal communication? I know you mentioned the visual um, mm. and the vocal. Uh, what are some, I'm sure that people would love to hear, ah, okay, so what are some things that if people do, if the scratch or the collar or the tie, what does that mean? There are a number of very famous ones. One of the most important is eye gaze, is visual gaze, where you look, when you look, how you look. It, it makes a big difference immediately, doesn't it? If I continue like this, you can't see my eyes, you can't see where I'm looking. Worse, if I do this, 
Oh, I looked goodness. like a bandit. I'm covering up so much details. Eye contact patterns are terribly interesting. Why do security people wear dark glasses? Why do blind people wear dark glasses? They wear, wear them for a good reason. Blind people wear them for a good reason because they cannot look you in the eye because they don't know exactly where you are. So they are not giving you wrong signals. Security people want to wear dark glasses so that you can't see where they're looking. The most difficult are people who wear reflecting dark glasses, like mirrors, because not only you can't see them, but you can see yourself. There's questions of collaboration, of liking. Do these two people like each other, love each other? Well, look at them. Look at their eye gaze patterns. Look at their pupil dilation. Look at the way, the frequency of where and when they look. This gives really interesting information. When you go into an elevator, a lift, you somehow stop looking at people. Why? Because you're too close to them. And closeness mm -hmm. affects the, uh, the, the gaze patterns. So there's a lot we, are, we know about eye gaze. There are many others. Let's take another one, gesture. This is a, a well-known gesture in some countries. The question is, what does it mean? Um, this gesture, that gesture, this gesture, and so forth. We in England come from a gesturally poor country. Americans are gesturally poor, whereas Italians are gesturally very rich. They have 20, 30 different gestures which come from all sorts of uh, regions and, and historical events. So how people, you know, if I describe my pain, how do I gesture my pain? Do I indicate that it's a, a rubbing pain or a throbbing pain? Doctors are trained to do this. So gesture is very interesting. Another one of great importance and great sensitivity is touch. Uh, in all cultures, mm. there's a great power of touch, the put it, laying on of hands. But of course, there's huge cultural difficulties and sensitivities. Where can I touch you? When can I touch you? What is the meaning of the touch? Other issues become uh, posture, how people stand and how they sit, whether they are, are bent over and so forth. There's a, a range of these factors which put together give you a really rich picture of what an individual is saying or indeed not saying. I would love to, you talked about the cultural differences a little bit and mm. I, I would like to take kind of current issues because that is a current, as we become a more globalized society, especially people in business have to interact with people of other cultures and therefore other cultural norms all the time. Um, but also, uh, now everyone is doing everything via Zoom. We're recording this uh, via video. Um, everyone has transitioned to video meetings and conferences. How does the interpretation or reading of body language as a potential advantage for communication suffer when we're doing everything now digitally? Well, of course, one of the things you can't see is you can't, we are talking heads. You can see my head. You don't know what yeah. trousers I'm wearing, whether I am wearing trousers. You can't see my hands very much. So you've got a very narrow view of, 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 of me at this moment. And let's say I'm feeling very uncomfortable. Well, you might be able to see it in my face, but you could probably see it more easily in my movements. The other thing about Zoom is now I'm looking in the camera, which looks as if I'm looking at you as opposed to looking at yes. you. That's yes. you. That's the camera. Now, one of the things I can do is I can look down at you and I can be close. And one of the things you notice when you're watching television or you're watching people on Zoom is they're not very experienced with this. Often, often they look down at their computer. And so you get the feeling of somebody looking down on you, literally looking down on you. And they're not very expressive. Now, there's a very famous broadcaster called David Attenborough, which many of you people yeah. will know. He does films on, on wildlife. And one of the things you notice about him, he's very animated. He changes the, his voice. He, you, you, he's very addictive. He's interesting to watch because he understands this, this uh, medium. It's a very cold medium, very small medium. I can just see your face. I can see the things behind you. But I don't, I'm not getting much of a picture of your, I'm, you know, we, we, psychologists talk about people leaking. Um, and you watch them in foot movements. I remember once I was on a television program and had to detect whether somebody was lying to me or not. And I said, well, I want her to sit on a bar stool. And they said, why a bar stool? So I said, first of all, I want her to be high up and I want to see possible movements, but I want to see the feet. I want to see movements in the feet because the anxiety, if you're lying, and if you're not a psychopath and feel guilty, the energy from the lying goes somewhere. 
it often goes into the lower parts of the body that we're not that sensitive to. We're sensitive to the face, where to look and this sort of thing, but not sensitive to hand movements. None of this you can see. So, you know, would you, would you like to negotiate with somebody on Zoom? Well, it would be all right, you'd get the information. But would you really get to understand them? Would you get to understand the issues that are crucial to them, sensitive to them? I think Zoom's fascinating. I've become more familiar with it, as indeed have you. But it is a restrictive medium. It is a restrictive medium, particularly non-verbally. There's lots of signals we don't get. And those are the really interesting ones for the psychologist to pick up to try and understand what people are really saying. Mm. Yes, and I, I have noticed just, I mean, there are so many things to adjust, but that the way that you sit in a chair, the clothes that you wear, and the way that you're able to vary the dynamic of your voice, there are so many other things that you have to play with when people can only see you um, via a computer screen versus taking the whole picture. Um, and, and that actually, you mentioned negotiation, and that leads me to, to ask you a question. Obviously, um, a lot of people watching this are thinking about, okay, how can I use maybe some changes to my own nonverbal communication to help me communicate power, strength in a meeting, in a negotiation? Are there certain tips or tricks of the trade that the body language expert can? Yes. Well, I think what you should do is you should watch politicians because politicians have been trained in these skills, in presentation skills. We all know Mr. Trump very well, like him or loathe him, he's a very well-known figure, but you're watching the debates, if you go back to the debates, he moves very slowly, he moves with intent and with power, with, with a, a sense of, of, of dignity. He's been taught to do that. They're trying to stop him using his hands so much, particularly one hand is uh, non-synchronously. I think what, and the other thing he does when he meets people, the way he grabs them, when you do the handshake, the handshake. you notice yeah. the hand is pulled in, and that's yeah. power. So the question is, in a negotiation, what image are you trying to give over? Are you trying to give over of, uh, an image of somebody who's, who's not particularly interested? I can buy this or leave it. It doesn't matter to me too much. Or am I very fascinated? It's, is it very important to me? Is it that I want to come over as somebody who's very honest, that you can really trust me and trust everything I say? What's the image I want to convey? Power, trust. Do you want me to, uh, do, do you uh, want to give the impression of being likable, you know, charming, witty, urbane sort of individual? And the psychologist will tell you to do many things to do that. Let me give you another example. We had a prime minister, he didn't last very long. It's called Gordon Brown. He's Scottish. Yeah, yeah. And he had a, he never smiled, he never smiled, and they obviously they taught they told him smile, and he, and you could see any psychologist would tell you that these things didn't match. Years and years ago, we worked with Mrs. Thatcher non-verbally. We did things to her. First of all, she came across as very powerful, as very strong, as very domineering, and we wanted to change her. So we got her to put her head on the side a little. You'll notice it was like this until 1984. And then that, just the movement of the head. Yeah. We tried to change the voice. She was shrill. So when she got angry, the voice went up and was shrill. And we tried to bring it down to be more relaxed like that. You changed the hair. The hair was too helmet-like, not feminine enough. So you, if you are say, here is a person you want to change their image, what is it you want to change about them? How would you go about doing that? Now, the question, therefore, is, thinking about yourself. What is it you want to convey in negotiations or anything? What are the primary issues? And what are the indicators of them? Is it, as I said before, is it power? Is it trustworthiness? And then work on those individually. It makes a small effect, but it can be a very important effect in the long term. Mm. Yeah, there, um, there are so many tools too as well. Like I know, especially for women, they talk about women do a lot of closed postures like this, cross the legs, put the hand around these very like low power poses, but that, that posture and those things, what do you want to convey and changing your body language also helps put you in the right mindset to go into that conversation. Exactly. You know, they'll say to you when, how you stand, you, know, you need your legs apart. Your gestures have to be um, um, symmetrical. Um, and there are, of course, as you say, uh, various signals where you can see people um, uh, defer to others. And 
you know, sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not appropriate. One of the big issues with this is idiosyncratic gestures and, and poses. Mr. Trump is very famous for his hands and, and all this. It does, it's idios, it's him, it's who he is. He's been doing it all his life. You can go back to the early tapes. And sometimes those idiosyncratic gestures or poses or postures that you've inherited have or originated in some childhood episode and need, I think, to be changed. You can see they've told Mr. Trump to hold the dais, not to use his hands. If possible, huh. don't gesture. Ah. And you can see it. That's Somebody's like taught to try to teach him to do that. In a famous speech recently, he did just that. The same was true of other politicians. So they've taken a gesture, something which is very characteristic of an individual, which is not very helpful, and tried to help people to change it. And I think the same is true of all of us. There are certain gestures you're not even aware of, some of the people are not aware of, that they might touch their nose a lot. Mr. Clinton was quite a nose touch. He, he, was, he actually was covering his mouth. He was covering his mouth sometimes because he was lying. We knew he was lying, we found out later. But you know, people, this gesture is often a gesture of, of saying, I'm worried about these porky pies, these lies coming out. So it looks as if I'm touching my nose. Actually, I'm unconsciously covering my mouth. And people are not aware of, when, you got, when you're very involved in communication, you're not aware of some of these things. And what uh, trainers will do is they'll film you and take you through it, going through your particular characteristics, saying, look then, you keep doing that. It's quite annoying. There was a very famous British television, but he kept on pushing his glasses up uh, onto his nose. He didn't need to, but it was his little anxiety gesture. It can be quite charming. It also can be very frustrating. And if you're in the business of communication, if you're a politician, if you're a, a diplomat, if you're a business person, you need to come across in a particular way. And you can be taught to do this better. And one of the things people who are interested in nonverbal communication do is train people. It's like acting skills. They train yeah. them in showing particular behaviors. Yeah. What are some of the biggest misunderstandings that can arise from trying to read someone or decode their body language? Because I love, I, I watched a talk you did online and, and, and Professor Furnham has really, really great talks online. So I recommend if you, if you want to hear more or learn more, first of all, you can check out his book, Body Language and Business on the Get Abstract Library. You can buy one of his 80 fabulous books. Or there we go, <laughs> um, shameless plug. Uh, or you can check out some of his, his videos on, on YouTube. Um, but in one, you talk about the fact that it's good to learn about how to read nonverbal communication, but we shouldn't let us bring us to a place of hubris, overconfidence. Yes, are, yeah. yes. I, I mean, the thing that I've been asked to do and many people have asked to do is to try and determine when people are lying, or at least when there's a disparity between what they're saying and what they really believe or what they really feel. And there's a lot of issues there. I think the one is, the issue is, first of all, you start with something called base rate. Base rate means how do people behave when they are comfortable and acting normally? Some are more talkative than others. Some move a lot, not what others. It is them. That's how they are. That's how they talk. That's how they move. That's them being normal, comfortable, typical. The question is when this changes, when suddenly my voice changes. My wife said the other day, oh, she said, you were, you were slightly nervous during that interview. I said, yes. She said, how do you know? Well, she said, I can hear it in the voice. She knows my voice. She can hear it, the anxiety in my voice, slightly constrained, slightly dry throat. What am I like? What, what is the person like when they're normal? And then when do these differences occur? What are they saying? What are they talking about? when suddenly there's a lot more head nodding, the foot begins to move. It's the mismatch between the normal and the, uh, the typical and the new state, but also between what they are saying, the words and the uh, non-verbals. So you, could, you can see that there's a nodding when they're actually disagreeing. I think some of the most interesting uh, examples of this of all time are where you see people confessing not confessing, on television, reporting some terrible crime, and they were the criminals. So the police, there's some wonderful examples of this, where somebody, a murderer, will appear on the television 
asking for somebody to help them find the murderer to their whatever and they are the murderer. Now, what they have to do then is express uh, amazing unhappiness, tearfulness, emotions. I have a friend who's an actor. I play bridge with him. And I said to him one day, Peter, can you cry on demand? He said, yes, I can cry on demand. I said, that's very impressive. How do you do this? And he said, well, I, I think about my uncle who died in a submarine and so forth. And I can bring forth a picture or an image, a little story, which will lead to tears. I know it will, and I, I won't do it now. I don't want to do it. But suddenly it's this, the, the idea that a person is talking about something, expressing an idea or belief, and suddenly you detect that's not quite right. It's, it's not quite the individual. They're different. That's, it's not necessary that they're lying, but that is for the, for the psychologist, for the ordinary person, most interesting. But you need to know, first of all, what they're like when they are normal, happy. When you see somebody for the first time, the fact that they move a lot doesn't mean anything because that's the sort of people they are. Mm. When suddenly they stop moving, oh, then it becomes interesting. So it's this idea of mismatch between normal, between when they are comfortable and now, and between often their gestures, what they're saying, what they're believing. You know, we, we have in our culture, uh, this is usually the yes, and this is usually no. It's not true in all cultures. So for instance, some people go like that for no, and this for yes, and the Indians, can do a head wobble, and that has other meanings. But I was dealing with somebody the other day who was disagreeing uh, with something, but nodding. And you thought, well, that's odd, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you're giving the gesture of agreement, but verbally, you're disagreeing. So what's going on here? And it's not as if you, you say, oh, you have to believe the non-verbal, the body language is the truth. Not necessarily, but it's the mismatch. Therein lies the clue for understanding uh, lying and deception. So, so fascinating. Um, I think we're all gonna walk around after this talk just <laughs> observing people and taking in all the visual data um, and, and um, audible data as well. Um, last question I have for you. Obviously you've uh, shared this material a lot in a variety of places, as I mentioned. You also, you've consulted for uh, major companies. What are some of the biggest takeaways often that businesses, people when they hear your talks, read your books, what are some of the biggest takeaways that they have? What have you seen make, make the most impact in your audiences? Um, well, I say to them, uh, imagine you are trying to detect whether somebody's lying or not. Would you rather phone them up or would you rather see them face to face? 90% of people, almost 100%, I'd rather see them. I can pick up the cues. And I said, well, you know, what, what cues are you looking for? And they're not very articulate. What I think people are most interested in is the vocal cues. Is the, they, they, not, they don't listen. It's, it's, you watch the person, you see their characteristics, but you don't always listen. What should you listen for? Well, you can listen for what is called latency of response. I ask you a question. What did you have for breakfast? And you answer. How long does it take you to answer? Now, it's easy to lie about facts. What did you have for breakfast? You can tell me you had muesli, you can have bacon and egg. You know, it's easy to lie about facts. Did you really love your mother? That's harder mm. to lie about. That's emotion. So it's about how long it takes people to respond. There's also issues around people making, choosing the wrong word, choosing clumsy words. The words don't quite fit. The Freudians called them parapraxies. I tell you another one of interest is, you notice this a lot with young people, and it's a characteristic of Australia and New Zealand. When they speak, they, call, they do pitch raises. The voices go up at the end, and they turn a statement into a question. And young people <laughs> do that. They turn statements into questions. Now, why do they do questions? Why do they do that? Do you believe me now? Is that okay? Mm. And so you listen for pitch raises. You listen for the quality of the voice. You listen for mistakes. You listen for people not using the I word. They distance themselves from the, from the episode. They say, well, people in general, it could be said and so forth. There are a number of these things. And I think one of the factors that people find interesting when I teach them is, yes, we go through, did you notice that gesture? And they all believe that nonverbal communication is best seen, it's visual, it's twitches and this sort of thing. 
I say, yes, yes, that's true. We can control that, but listen. Listen to what they say. Listen to their words. Listen to repetitions. This is the skill of a clinical psychologist. People drop little, you know, the, why is this word being repeated? That word being repeated. What is that all about? And I think, as I said, it's the words are as good as the, as the uh, so listening to somebody on a tape recording. It was a very, very famous study done 40 years ago. Two uh, it was a psychologists where they had an American presidential debate. Uh, Richard Nixon was one of the people, and I think Kennedy was the other one. Yeah. And the people who listened to the broadcast thought that Nixon had won. And the yeah, people who yeah. saw it thought that Nixon had lost. Nixon sweated a lot. He was he he looked like he was a crook. He looked like a crook. He sweated. He also never shaved appropriately. And so there you had a very interesting example where he was a very coherent man vi verbally, but visually not coherent. So. I think the takeaway is listen more carefully and look for where the words and the gestures, whatever they are, don't fit. That mismatch concept is the important one. So, so good. Thank you so much, Professor. I really, really appreciate your time, your insights and wisdom. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Yeah, and thank all of you so much for watching. I really hope that you've been enjoying this series. I feel like every single time I am learning a ton. Um, but again, if you want to hear more or read more, you can go to our Get Abstract Library and uh, search for Professor Adrian Furnham and his book, um, Body Language in Business, as well as all of his other works. Um, and we will be back soon with another episode to discuss more about how to understand people. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye.